In this episode, fire bombers at our home airport? Yes, the Coastal Airstrike team is calling Foxtrot 95 home base this fire season. All right, well, I'm at uh, Foxtrot 95, my home airport today. I'm gonna show you a little bit about the uh, fire bombers that are based here. At my home airport today, Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport in the northwest area of South um, of Florida. I'm from South Florida. And there's some really interesting stuff going on here today. And I thought I would uh, change it up a little bit and just share with you. We've got Aaron uh, here. Introduce yourself and the company you're from. Aaron Vince with Coastal Air Strike. We're based in southern Florida, uh, predominantly a firefighting based company with single engine air tankers. So many of you may not be aware that uh, a couple weeks back, we had a really big fire. What was the name of it again, the fire? Bertha Complex. The Bertha Complex. The complex meaning that there's several fires involved in one large fire, several areas. And I think it was up to like 33,000 acres at one point in time. That's right. All right. And luckily we had a really big couple storms that came through and it is a swamp. It was dry and it is no longer dry. But they were called in because it was basically uh, practically a state emergency, correct? State emergency, the state of Florida got emergency funds to help with the uh, downed debris from Hurricane Michael y'all had in 2018, which the, they've known it's been a problem for a couple of years now. And then the Bertha complex pretty much became their worst nightmare and realized that they gonna, were going to need more resources to help. So back up uh, a couple of years back, uh, Hurricane Michael came through this area of the Panhandle, which was basically a, a very tightly wound hurricane, practically a very large tornado um, that came through. And just th this area is known for having a lot of uh, tree farms. So we had a lot of pine trees that snapped in half, fell on the ground, which basically created fuel years later for fire season. And, and fire, when does fire season officially start in this area? Uh, pre predominantly, April through June in the Panhandle of Florida. Okay, so this fire broke out right before fire season started and, and just grew and grew. So luckily our, our, our governor, I guess, uh, That's right. signed it, something that allowed the funding for this. So you guys are with this for about 60 days? The state um, granted us a 60 day contract to be here the entire time and just for the main area f uh, affected by Hurricane Michael. So, so that's the why they're here and just i don't know about you guys but uh being a big lover of aviation and as a as a kid in my area of growing up there was a lot of farm fields so off the distance there's always a crop duster zooming in and out and buzzing the fields and stuff like that which also of course um in, encouraged me to get into aviation seeing that all the time so having these guys at the airport just brings back those memories plus it's, it's a different setup you guys don't have the spray fans on them you've got is it bombers so explain what it is that so explain the why they're here we're gonna explain the what now what is it and how is it set up so it's an 802 air tractor 
uh, the government refers to them as single engine air tankers or a seat. They carry 800 gallons of liquid and they're set up with a basically an inline bomb door that we can adjust the opening settings of the doors to give different coverage levels of product delivery. So you can actually control how much the door is open. That basically, does that control how, how wide your, your, your spray is or your drop? That, uh, yeah, we're controlling the width of the door opening, which controls the length of line that we're drawing. Okay, okay. Same uh, amount also... of width of coverage, but the length of the line fluctuates from that door opening size. Can I assume that you, you flow more, obviously the doors are open more, so you, it goes out faster? Yeah, so they're, they're referred to as coverage level one, two, three, four, or six. So a coverage level one would give you approximately a thousand feet of line, and a coverage level four would give you 350 to 400 feet of line. And from the cockpit, how is that set up? Is this a, a lever with a notch in it, or do you have a push button to, to select those? It's a little computer in there, and we just select coverage level, and the computer does the rest. We just pull the trigger to open the, or close the door. Awesome, awesome. So when you guys are doing these strafing runs, are you, are you making uh, any special effects or sounds as you're, you're bombing these fires? We got Top Gun music in the background. <laughs> <laughs>
Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. That is awesome. Well, well Aaron, um, talk uh, just a couple minutes of how you personally got involved in aviation and then to, to this now as a, as a business, as a career. Well, kind of like you were saying, you know, in high school, I met the local crop duster and figured I would, um, you know, something different and that'd be pretty cool. I could do that and went to Louisiana Tech's aviation program, got a four year degree with them. Thought I was going to do airlines or corporate. But all my friends were in crop dusting, so did crop dusting for 11 years before I started getting into the fire business and was doing fire part-time, but still mostly spraying. And then I started doing fire full-time in 2014. Now, I know with crop dusters, I've looked at this in the past thinking it would be a cool career path as well. You have to be like some type of hazmat certifi certified certification because the chemical that you're using, that kind of stuff. Um, is there something that you have to do to be able to drop water <laughs> to get certified well, other, yeah. other than learn how to fly a crop duster? The, um, the government requires you to do NAFA um, fire training at the National Aerial Firefighting Academy. They, so you have to attend their NAFA program, you have to attend company training, and then you have to go through a DOI carding process to become qualified to fly the seat in addition to, the, of course, meeting the qualifications to fly the airframe. So Coastal Airstrike, uh, you were originally from Louisiana. You have a base here. How many different locations are you in North America uh, at the moment? So under the new ownership of Michael Hutchins starting in 2020, uh, we went from six planes in the fleet to now 12, and two of those being the Fireboss, which is the 802 on floats, converting it to a scooper. So we preposition two or three planes in Immokalee, four in Abilene, Texas, two or three in Rowe, Arkansas, and then based on the needs of the activity, we'll move them around from there. And then generally when the fire season in June starts, we'll move everything to, uh, most everything to say, Utah, Nevada, Idaho. Oregon. So you guys try to keep them somewhat regional so you don't have to transfer them very far? Do you sometimes will take all of your assets to one spot depending on? No, we usually don't take it to one specific location, but definitely a geographical location, say. Like in June, we'll go out and pre-position a couple in Utah, a couple in Oregon, and a couple in um, northern Nevada and just wait for the government to put us on contract. Okay, let's switch over to um, the mechanics of these aircraft for a minute. Uh, I think I saw a, a sticker on it. Um, these are powered by Pratt & Whitney engines? That's right, it's a um, Pratt & Whitney PT-6 AG, which is designated as AG, and it's uh, producing 1,300 horsepower. 1,300 horsepower, okay. And you've got, uh, I think it's a, is it a five, five blade prop on that? Five bladed Hartzell propeller, that's right. What, what is, um, some of the performance numbers that you can see both empty and loaded on this with that kind of power? Loaded, we generally ferry back and forth to the fire at 150 miles an hour. Empty, I think cruise speeds are closer to 180 empty. And what, um, what is your, your takeoff roll? Because you, you can carry how, 800 gallons? 800 gallons, which brings us to a gross weight of 16,000 takeoff. Wow, 16,000. That is some weight. Without a type rating requirement. That is some weight. I'm used to talking to, to like experimental light sport planes, which are like, you know, 13, 1400 pounds. So 16,000 <laughs> is quite a jump up there. I don't, I don't think, is. yeah, my airplane would never get off the ground with that, that weight. You got to learn weight management for sure. So, so at that fully loaded, what kind of ground roll are you seeing? Because you're, you got to be able to take off from, I would assume also, other strips other than paved strips, correct? Or do you try to stick to developed airports? Well, when they use for crop dust and steel, you know, a lot of people are still operating them from grass runways. 
but in the fire, we typically get at a local municipal airport. Okay. Uh, ground rolls like here where we are today in Florida, 22, 2,500 feet. You get out to higher density altitudes out west during the summer with 110 degree temperature and density altitude of 10,000, you're looking at 4,500 approaching 5,000 foot runway roll. Yeah, something we don't think about too much here in Florida. We might have a, a bad day of 3,000, but not 10,000 because right. you're already up at elevation plus all the heat and stuff like that. So that's, that's a big difference. Uh, that's amazing. Um, what is um, what does the training period look like for you guys to get into? Is it more like a type rating for this or? No, our tractor's got an exemption because of the exceeding the what 12.5. Uh, they've had this agreement with the FAA to where they're not required to, the pilot's not required to have a type rating at present time. So generally, you know, of course you need a lot of tail wheel time. So if you could fly a smaller model, the 402 or 502 air tractor, that's a good leading in. Um, but the more tail wheel time, the better, regardless of what plane it is. So what do you think are the minimums from your experience? I'm sure each company is a little bit different, but insurance companies probably really dictate what that is. What is the minimum tail wheel time and turbine time and stuff like that to get into this? From our government contracts, it's 1,500 minimum fixed wing, 100 dispersal of some kind of dispersion of uh, crop chemicals or water, um, 200 hours of mountain time, and 25 hours in type, which if you come in not having any 802 time, generally by the time you run through company training, you've achieved the 25 hours in type. but Generally, you know, Coastal likes to see 800 to 1,000 plus hours of tailwheel time and, and some 802 time being preferred or some kind of ag time preferred. But we've got guys that, you know, we bought on board that doesn't come from an ag background. Okay. Well, walk us through the, the exciting part here when you're actually fighting a fire and you're approaching, of course, you can see the smoke from, from well off billowing up. Uh, this building might be you know, good up to that point, but then degrading quickly. What is it like to actually bomb a fire? And, and what are you doing to set up? Like, you know, we're setting up to a landing. We have a, a pattern we fly, you know, base to final. Do you kind of treat that similarly? Or what does it look like? Kind of walk us through fighting a fire. It's pretty much the same, same as a pattern, or a landing pattern. We, we, you know, we're setting up with 120 miles an hour indicated, a notch of flaps, prop full forward and we creating a downwind base and, and funnel to the to the drop area, whether it be a fire line, active fire line, or building retarding line in support of the ground crew. You okay. know, we, we could be possibly be a couple miles from the fire line, or we could be right there at the fire line, just depending on what would the objective of the mission that the ground crew has set, you know? Yeah, I would, I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong here, you'd have to probably attack it a little bit at an angle because if you're directly landing like at an airport and you're trying to be into the wind, your smoke is going to be following the wind. So you, don't, you wouldn't want to be blinded by the smoke. So you, you have to come out at an angle. Yeah, we got to play the wind with the column. You know, sometimes the column's in our favor and sometimes it's not if we can get under the column or penetrate it just briefly, we'll do that. But if, you know, sometimes we just have to abandon that side of the fire and go work in another area. All right, so being this is a smoky environment, cloudy environment, uh, do you basically maintain VFR rules the whole time? Or is there times that you, if you can see through the smoke, you can you can punch through as you're doing a drop to come through? Yeah, we, we still operate on the 91 um, VFR flight rules, but we do penetrate the column briefly from time to time. Uh, the government does require that all the pilots are instrument rated, but the airplanes are not instrument certified. But um, yeah, we're supposed to be maintaining VFR at all times, but it does get smoky, you know, late July, August, okay. a lot of smoke. And on, on that same way of thinking, could I assume, do you guys carry oxygen? Is there, is there times where it gets very smoky? You have to worry about carbon monoxide that uh, you want to have no. a mask on or? No, it's usually never like that because you're usually on scene just minutes at most, you know, going through a smoke. 
for just seconds. Okay, so, so most, most of that or the concerning part would stay in that smoke column and you've got fresh air around it essentially? Yeah, we've got air conditioned cockpits. Okay. So that helps. <laughs> <laughs> So we got good ventilation. Well, plus it's probably not as concentrated as an exhaust right. leak coming straight into the cockpit because that's already aerated, if you will. That's right. You can definitely smell the smoke in the cockpit, the smell, but... Okay. I was just thinking that because as these fires were burning, probably 20 miles south of my house, there was ash falling in the yard and, and uh, the wind was picking up, so it was kind of keeping the smoke low. So it actually got very smoky in my neighborhood. And I just started thinking about as a pilot flying through it what that might look like and if hypoxia would be an issue or something like that if you're no, flying through a lot of it. I don't know of any experiences where that's been an issue. Okay. Well, you would know. You've been in the <laughs> industry for quite some time. All right, Aaron, well, thanks for taking a few minutes here at, uh, at my airport, our airport, to explain what you do and how you do it and a little bit behind the scenes of what it's like to fight fires from an airplane. Um, I know your website, I think, is Coastal Airstrike. Uh, CoastalAirstrike.com. You can find out more about us on our website and Facebook. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely will be following you guys uh, as you travel around because it, it's an interesting uh, thing to, to, to follow, um, you guys fighting fires. And, and of course, um, we had this demonstration out here earlier today and I was out there capturing, I'm dropping the water and I just think back to the classic movie of Always. In fact, we talked about that on radio. There was, there was a, I don't know if it was you or it was like directly in line with me for a second before we turned on the canal and like, like, I want the shot. I want the <laughs> shot. But I don't know if I want to get soaked for the shots. <laughs> so thank you for the demonstration today and having your team come out and uh, be here for uh, the season. We're glad to be here and thank you.